Thank you very much. Uh, we've got a couple of um, housekeeping things. Well, not, well one housekeeping. Uh, Dr. Sarah Wilmot from the John Innes Institute uh, has just informed me that there is a brand new pamphlet all about the collections over the John Innes Centre. And so there are extra copies of these somewhere at the back of the room for those of you who use that exceptionally uh, valuable resource. Um, second thing, just to sort of build on some of the, the, uh, the work that we've heard today, and actually building on some of the commentary, I just want to, so many of you would have um, been here for the sessions this morning, would have heard Jonathan Harwood's comments on those papers, and at one point he uh, voiced some significant scepticism about some of the claims that are made on Mendelism's and genetics behalf in the 20th century uh, for plant and animal breeding, and so I just want you to bear that first thing in mind. And then in the second set of commentaries from Frank Okota, yes, good, um, he suggested that we in the 20th century might follow the germplasm. And now I want to hold those two things up just in your mind from what we've heard today, whether or not there's any tension there and all that kind of thing as we go into my, my paper. <coughs> okay, good. Right, so thank you all very much for coming. Um, my paper is about genetics and plant breeding in interwar Britain. And I'm going to be asking to what extent genetics changed British plant breeding prior to the Second World War. Obviously, this is not a novel question. Most of the work on plant and animal breeding in the 20th century has, to some extent, looked to question the impact of genetics. So, what do I offer that is new? Two things. Firstly, until now, historians have typically focused upon changes that may or may not have occurred in breeding practice. They have looked to see how quickly different genetic ideas were taken up by plant breeders and, in turn, how plant breeders influenced genetic theory. In contrast to these existing accounts, I'll be focusing upon changes in the plant breeding market in order to better assess how genetics change the shape of the industry rather than breeding practice directly. Secondly, most historians tend to agree that there was at least one important theoretical innovation that did put plant and animal breeding on a new professional footing, namely pure line breeding and Wilhelm Johansson's distinction between genotype and phenotype. Put in its most forthright terms by Neil Johansson, it is argued that, and I quote, a clear distinction between genotype and phenotype is widely considered to be the foundation stone of classical genetics. With the early Mendelians, our view of the units of heredity is said to have changed. Genes are supposed to become these discrete, interchangeable units, devoid of a history of their own. In other words, the gene is dehistoricized. This is a point that I'm sure many of you have come across before. It was eloquently put by Johansson himself when he wrote that ancestral influence, i.e. all those influences on a variety inherited across generations, were nothing but a mystical expression for a fiction. More recently, Christophe Bonnoy has written that, in this wide cultural shift, a deep and intrinsic genetic identity was constructed for living organisms separated from the influence of place and the environment. In turn, the dehistoricized gene has been said to have had a profound effect on the plant breeding industry. It's widely held that once armed with this new understanding of heredity, geneticists were able to take over the business of breeding. Summarizing much of this historiography, Tiago Sarajevo has written that, by instituting a hard genetic identity of the living organism independent of place or environment, formed by immutable genes or the equally immutable pure lines, geneticists open the field to the mass production of stable life forms. <coughs> now, it would be wrong of me to suggest that some historians haven't already tried to make this story problematic. Indeed, Tiago Sarajevo here is setting up this current historiographical state of affairs precisely as a problem, so as to better consider how these changes actually came about. Nevertheless, on the whole, I find that historians and science study scholars have tended to take the dehistoricized gene much too seriously, spending a lot of time working out its own history and philosophical implications. I would instead urge that it was the geneticist's ability to convince people to talk like this that we live with today, and not the idea itself. So here's how I'll make my case. I will first introduce the problem of plant synonyms, which will be used as our lens on the world of plant breeding. Indeed, synonyms have been used in this way by previous historians, 
so I'll also be bringing the historiography right up to date with my own research. As will be seen, synonyms drive directly at the problem of varietal identity, genetic stability, and varietal history. I will then go on to explain how Britain's National Institute of Agricultural Botany, or NIAB, set about attempting to police synonyms. This sort of regulatory action, which NIAB only began in 1930, is typically seen as a product of precisely the new genetic mentality. If varieties are made up of their genes, and genes are incorruptible, then their flow should be regulated. This is where we should find the dehistoricized gene in action, especially as most existing accounts consider it to have achieved preeminence by around 1920. However, and in the third and final section, I demonstrate that things were by no means so straightforward. Leaders of the British plant breeding industry and the scientists they worked with maintained many of their older values while at the same time apparently posing themselves as new Mendelians. I close my paper by showing some of the difficulties that Nayab faced in attempting to police synonyms in such a culture. Each one of the problems I outline places the history of varieties and their genes at the very centre of our understanding. In short, I argue that the gene was never dehistoricized, at least not until long after the Second World War. So, without further ado, synonyms. A synonym in plant breeding is when the same variety is traded under different names by different breeders. For instance, yeoman wheat might be sold elsewhere as yeoman master or yeoman king, etc. They are typically seen as a form of fraud or counterfeiting and as a way of robbing original breeders of the money and acclaim the they deserve. However, this is not the only way they can be interpreted. To give you a little more of a flavour of what the problem of synonyms entails, I shall introduce you to the excitingly named Thomas Wibbley. He's an interesting figure, and while his pioneering ad advocacy of factory farming has been noted by Abigail Woods, little else about Wibbley is known. Here's how he fits into my story. From the work of Beres Charnley, we know that in 1926, one of the largest seed houses in Britain was publicly accused of selling synonyms by one of the world's most famous geneticists. Roland Biffin, a Cambridge University plant breeder, caused something of a scandal by claiming that the seed firm Carters had been selling selections of plants when really they had changed nothing about them. The selling of such selections, he felt, was precisely the kind of activity that marked the pre-Mendelian age when the mechanisms of heredity were unknown. The subject of synonyms was also, of course, particularly close to Biffin's heart, as it was his own most successful varieties that firms such as Carter's had taken on and then renamed. In the existing historiography, this is where the story ends, with Biffin making a strong public claim for the greater expertise of geneticists. I'm now in a position to move this story forward a little. It turns out that Carter's actually took Biffin's challenge relatively seriously, and that same year employed this man, a professor of agricultural botany from University College Cork, to oversee their plant breeding activities. Wibberley's time as an employee of Carter's between 1926 and his unexpected death in 1930 is obviously quite short. However, it is what Wibberley claims to have achieved in this brief period that makes his case so instructive. After a year, Wibberley was given the first few pages of Carter's 1927 serials catalogue to write about his work. His essay, which was really just an extended advert for Carter's, charted the rapid improvements in scientific reading that had taken place. He heaped praise on Roland Biffin, as well as George Stapledon of the Welsh Farm Breeding Institute, and Herbert Hunter, newly employed as a colleague of Biffin's down at Cambridge, and he praised all of the valuable varieties they had produced. However, he then went on to consider the life of varieties once free from their originators. Only the experienced realise, he said, how very difficult it is to produce an entirely new type of cereal by crossbreeding. One may cross-fertilise a very large number of plants without obtaining a single plant in any way superior to either parent. Even when one is successful in breeding a new type of plant with some distinct superior feature, e.g. the milling qualities of Biffin's yeoman, a large amount of work has still to be done to acclimatise and in other ways make the variety suitable for ordinary farming conditions. I would urge that this paragraph captures the state of British cereal breeding right up to the Second World War. It was a culture in which Mendelian principles were not just accepted, as we see here with Wibberley's praise for Mendelian breeders, 
but were assimilated within traditional industrial practices, as we see with his emphasis on acclimatisation. Varieties were not stripped of their history, as Biffin had attempted to argue when claiming that Carters were only selling synonyms, but continued to carry their history alongside their genetic constitution. To demonstrate this industry in action, let us now consider how synonyms were tackled by Britain's National Institute of Agricultural Botany. If the dehistoricised gene were to, have in play, were to have played an important role anywhere, it would show itself here. NIAB, which still exists today, was founded in 1919 by grants from the Ministry of Agriculture and another government body that no longer exists, the Development Commission. All you really need to know is that it was the premier UK centre for cereals crops, not for their breeding, but for their assessment and regulation. And in 1930, the year of Wibberley's death, they also decided to begin policing synonyms by creating the Serial Synonym Committee. Members of the committee included our very own synonym-hating Roland Biffin and his colleague Herbert Hunter, alongside a representative of the National Farmers Union and a representative of the seed trade. NIAB even had the daddy of agricultural botany himself, John Percival, act as a corresponding member. What they would do was trawl through the catalogues of the most important seed houses, or work on tip-offs from trade members. Then they would grow on seeds from stocks labelled as one particular variety. If NIAB decided they'd found a synonym, they would write to the seed house in question, asking them to remove it from their catalogues. If they refused, NIAB would then publish the name of the firm alongside the synonymous variety name very widely in the agricultural press. On the surface, the very fact that NIAB was trying to police varietal identity in this way might make it seem as though it had adopted the new definition of varietal and genetic identity, i.e. the dehistoricised gene. After all, without some form of one-to-one -one relationship between plant name and plant variety, regardless of that variety's history, how could they even proceed? Indeed, Paolo Palladino has argued that the campaign to eliminate synonymous varieties appears to have been very effective in eliminating the smaller seed firms from the market <coughs> and in dis discouraging the propagation of synonyms. On this view, then, NIAB's Serial Synonym Committee played an important role in professionalising plant breeding and in institutionalising a strong genetic perspective. However, if you look at the actual way that NIAB operated, it is clear that varietal history remained important. There is, in fact, very little evidence that the work of the Serial Synonym Committee changed much at all. I'll show this by looking at three problems faced by NIAB's committee, and in each case, the history of varieties, rather than just their genetic constitution, is brought to the fore. So problem number one, trueness to type. If Nyab decided that a breeder or farmer was actually propagating a synonym, that breeder could reply that yes, the variety they were selling under one name was certainly the same as another variety that already exists. But they could argue, after the years of selection and careful attention given to their stock, it was now the case that their plants were much truer to type than the somewhat mongrel stocks found in general circulation. If this breeder decided to reward his efforts by giving his stock a name distinct from the mother variety, then this was his to grant. Here the history of plants mattered, rather than just their genetic constitution, because it attests to stewardship over varietal identity. Today this is a skill that is instead embedded within official institutions. Problem number two, plant fluctuation. Many valuable plant characters, such as molting quality or yield, are highly variable and difficult to measure. Moreover, how could Nyab differentiate between two varieties when the characteristics used, such as tint of grain or length of plant here, can all overlap thanks to fluctuation? Meaning one variety of plant gives one appearance in one year and one location, but a different one in another. Does the presence of this fluctuation mean one is working with one stable variety or an impure one? This makes plant identity contingent with space and time, not separate from it. A plant could not be defined solely by its genetic components if different environments produce different plants. One needed to know that stock's previous history. Finally, problem number three, which is more difficult than the first two as it involves heredity. There were many breeders, as we saw with Wibberley, who claimed to have acclimatised their plants to a particular set of environmental conditions. <coughs> While these plants might give all the appearance of being the same as a synonym, in actual fact, after years of selection, these plants were believed to be more resilient to the climate or better at dealing with soil conditions, etc., than stocks of that variety when they were first grown in the region. Even in a tiny country like the UK, this phenomenon was well recognised. The Oxford botanist, Professor T.G.B. Osborne, could write as late as 1947 that, and I quote, seeds to provide British crops should come from British-grown parents, 
which in their development and multiplication have been through the selective sieves of British climate and British conditions. To urge this is not scientific jingoism, if such a thing exists. It seems to me good ecology. This third problem, then, seems to penetrate that internal heritable realm that Johansson supposedly removed from its surroundings. In this instance, history matters because it might mean something about your hereditary constitution. So how did Nayef solve these three problems? Well, it didn't, but instead allowed all breeders who made such a claim to attach their own variety name as a suffix to the true name as judged by Nayef. This is hardly a brave new genetic world full of dehistoricized interchangeable genes. So to conclude, I hope to have convinced you that history continued to matter for plant varieties in Britain, at least until after the Second World War. How the plant breeding industry was actually transformed remains unknown. What we can say for certain is that this change was not a product of some new appreciation of the dehistoricized gene. Of course, it no doubt depended upon the new language of genetics, but this was not sufficient. It was a transformation that involved a double forgetting, both the history of genetics and the history of varieties. Thank you.